Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to our March 12th Salina Legal Women Voters Lunch and Learn. Forgot where I was. Um, and hope you're enjoying your almost spring. And um, today we have Jason Graves from the Central Kansas District um, from K-State. And he's going to talk to us about pollinators and maybe a little bit of ground soil. Well, you know, we had talked about something. doing soil too, and it's hard to get all that in one talk, but we'll, you know, a lot of time for questions too, so, you know, we'll talk a little bit pollinators and a little bit everything. And I'm very partial to the bees because did you know that the bee is a symbol for Mary Kay Cosmetics? <laughs> because bees shouldn't know how to fly. They're aerodynamical, they're not able to fly, but they fly anyway. So. We just go out and do whether we think we can or not because we don't know any different. <laughs> so these are my favorites. So I'm going to turn it over to Jason and let him introduce himself and get started. Okay, appreciate it. Um, yeah, well, it, it is feeling a lot like spring, and we've had a lot of uh, interest already with the nice weather and folks being out in, in the gardens and landscapes and. You know, this topic is always a good spring topic because, uh, you know, in my role with Extension, you know, we're always trying to connect people to resources through K-State and just through uh, the information that we have to share. And, uh, of course, there's just a lot of interest in um, pollinators and insects, um, native plants. Uh, a lot of those topics have just grown in uh, interest with a lot of home gardeners, a lot of uh, and uh, even just in whether it's a small backyard, big backyard, whatever you got, a lot of folks are interested in this topic. And so <clears throat> we thought that'd be a good one to cover today, uh, jumping into spring, the spring season. And uh, so that's kind of the trajectory we've got. As you can see, we're going to talk about native plants uh, to support native bees. And uh, of course, that's one of the things I wanted to highlight uh, primarily was uh, some of our native bees, and maybe give you a little more information about those, just uh, because I, I find a lot of people are a little less familiar with some of our native bees than they might be with, uh, say, like the European honeybee, which is very well known, you know, uh, to a lot of folks uh, because it produces honey, right? And so, a uh, valuable thing for a lot of us. So, Anyway, so our object, uh, objectives I'll share uh, quickly. Uh, importance of pollinators, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but of course they connect directly to human health and well-being. Uh, and then we'll talk about a little bit of our native bee pollinators, uh, some flowers, uh, characteristics about pollinators that, you know, uh, especially pollinator uh, plants that we need to know uh, and habitat, and then uh, you know, we'll highlight some plants you might want to use in your own yard. So, uh, just kind of an uh, outline there. I like to always start uh, by talking about how nature, uh, we know it is a basic human need. Uh, we have an need, innate need for nature relatedness as human beings. Um, and we don't really need research to tell us that, but we actually have research that has documented and done a lot of um, some of these studies you can look at have really uh, found profound connection uh, to uh, this, this reality that is, as people, we need to be connected to nature for our own health and well-being. And if we're not, uh, we are uh, at a deficit uh, uh, as far as health would be defined. And so uh, there's actually a study that came out in 2022 that I thought was fascinating, 227 unique pathways through which interaction with nature positively impacts our own well-being as people. So there's a lot of tangible and intangible benefits to just being outdoors in nature. Uh, you know, uh, and so one of the top of the list I thought was interesting was mental health. And of course mental health is uh, in many ways crisis levels uh, around us. Uh, and you know, it's interesting that nature and nature experiences actually are directly connected to mental health. And so that's uh, interesting stuff in, in, in the research. But it matters in 2024 because, you know, we're all connected and we, we see more and more, especially our, our younger generations, uh, connected more to uh, technology, which in, in many ways is, is more, it's a stress, 
it's a, it's a different kind of attention that we have to use in an indoor environment with technology. And nature provides things that that can never provide. It's very restorative for people. And I don't have time to go into why that is, but it's fascinating. And so um, it just sets the stage to understand why it's so important we <clears throat> are having nature experiences. And uh, pollinators is kind of a gateway, so to speak. Uh, into that reality, and it's it's a fun uh, topic to get into because it, it provides connection directly to um, what we're talking about. Um, we talk about bees and butterflies are just a great way to get people interested in nature. And so, uh, pollinators are keystone species, and so that's one uh, insect that we highlight and we do a lot of uh, teaching about because uh, we call. Uh, Keystone species just means large numbers of other species in an ecosystem depend on pollinators. So they're kind of the center of an ecosystem. And without pollinators, many other species would cease to exist. They couldn't. Uh, and it, it's, it's interesting, large number of other species depend on pollinators and, and our ability to continue to help pollinators survive. And so that's why they're keystone species. Of course, 80% of the plants on the planet, probably more actually, rely on that pollination to reproduce themselves. And of course, our food you know, uh, is, is highly connected to the activity of pollinators as well. Uh, biodiversity, which is a word that we use to really define life. I mean, it's just a fancy science word that means the variety of life around you uh, is biodiversity. And we, we like to use that because um, these are the things that pollinators are connected to directly in our lives through, through the plant mediation, uh, or the, the pollination that they provide uh, and, and the reproduction of our plants. Um, you can see all the different ecosystem services that are connected to plants and really this ability uh, to uh, have biodiversity uh, connects us, of course, to all these things, food, fresh water, um, all the, the regulation of uh, air and water and nutrients and soil, uh, and then the mental and, uh, and spiritual and aesthetic uh, and cultural things that, that plants provide. So there's just a whole slew of things we call e ecosystem services um, that are dependent on pollination and pollinators. Um, and we like to, uh, they're I like to say pollinators are directly connected to all the things that matter, you know, food, water, air, medicine, mental health, uh, much more. So uh, biodiversity is what keeps us healthy and alive as individuals, as people. We are a part of this world that depends on biodiversity. Biodiversity is kind of like this engine that creates all these ecosystem services that we're using to, every single day without even knowing it, from just the air we breathe, water we drink, all those things are coming uh, as a direct result of the biodiversity that's out there. And so biodiversity is declining, which is the concern, and, and so you've probably seen different, uh, oh, there's, folks talk about this a lot. There, the songbird population is one that we watch closely as, a, as an indicator of this, and um, this study really highlighted that back in 2019, all the uh, steep declines in some of our uh, important songbirds, and you know some of these, um, you know, have declined in, in large, large numbers to the point where they're no longer, longer, actually fulfilling their kind of niche in the ecosystem. I mean, they're still there, but they're the the part they play. There's just not enough of these uh, birds to play that part, and so a lot, uh, a lot of interest in songbirds and habitat that's out there. Bees in kind of the similar situation. You can find lots of studies, especially related to bumblebees, because that is one uh, an insect that, that can be studied uh, and counted, and so that a lot of uh, folks do that. And so there's research out there that can connect you to information about the decline in, in some of our native pollinators also. Um, and so I just highlight that because that's where gardeners come in. That's where you and I have a, a neat role we can play in, in actually building this biodiversity back. Uh, and bringing back, um, in fact, our, our city uh, urban landscapes are really kind of the frontier for, for where this needs to go um, as far as uh, being able to house biodiversity and bring nature back. Um, and so biodiversity, that idea of 
the variety of life around us. Um, the, the neat thing about biodiversity is its, its foundation is in plants. And so uh, plants are really the foundation for biodiversity on our planet. And so for gardeners, that's a, that's a neat thing to learn because we all love plants. We all love plants in our backyards, flowers, trees, shrubs, in our landscapes. Um, we just need more plants and we need the right ones. And when we put these things in our landscapes uh, and we grow them, then we're going to build biodiversity right where we're at. Uh, it's amazing what happens when we put the plants back that build up this biodiversity. Um, and so habitat's an urgent need um, just because land has changed and use of land has changed so dramatically. Uh, you know, uh, and so there's just, we don't have the large swaths of prairie that were once were. We don't have, um, and so, you know, we have to rethink, um, that's what we like to help the gardeners do is rethink um, a little bit of maybe their own landscape and what they're using it for. Um, there is an aesthetic pur purpose to a landscape, but there's also more than aesthetics uh, to landscapes. Uh, if we're into biodiversity, we can actually build landscapes for biodiversity as well. And so uh, we, we connect this to pollinators um, and the decline of pollinators primarily. Those are the, it's really the biggest two factors going into, especially our native bees and some of the reasons they're endangered. Um, the habitat loss, we've lost a lot of the nesting sites for those pollinators and the forage loss, uh, of course, the pollen and nectar, the flower sources that they need um, to be able to survive, uh, much like the songbirds, it's very similar. So um, there's some other reasons and other things that can cause decline, but the habitat and forage loss are really the two biggies uh, when it comes to pollinators. And, you know, habitat for pollinators really includes um, three things, and what you can see here, food, of course, um, just like you and I, we need food, uh, and so pollinators, for pollinators, that's a diversity of plants. Um, it can be a, uh, native plants really fill that niche really well because they have a history together. Uh, but it doesn't have to be just native plants either. Um, we need nesting and egg laying sites uh, for those pollinators, and we need sheltered, undisturbed places for hibernation and overwintering. So, you know, habitat for pollinators is not just flowers. Um, there's a lot more that they need, and as we get to understand that, we can actually build that, that kind of habitat right in our backyard. This uh, diagram, or I guess uh, an illustration from um, the Oregon Bee Project kind of highlights the idea of where are these pollinators? Where is that habitat? Um, and you'll see here, this, this just quickly highlights some of the various things that our native pollinators, uh, where they are residing. It might be in a tree snag, in an old dead tree. It might be in a stem of a shrub, a hollow stem shrub. It might be in a, a stump. <coughs> A lot of our pollinators nest in the soil, and so our native, and we're going to look at some of these, but it just highlights the idea that uh, our native pollinators especially are not just in hives. They're not even social, most of them. They're very solitary. So as we get to know their needs and, and what they need to thrive, we start to think in different ways about our backyard. Uh, bumblebees make a really nice case study because, um, as you can see here, they're uh, one of my favorite uh, pollinators uh, because they're native. They're, there's a lot of native bumblebees. They're extremely fun to observe. Uh, they're great pollinators. They're, they're wonderful pollinators for a lot of our edible uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, and they, they pollinate in uh, much cooler and windier conditions than other bees can. They can fly longer distances. So uh, certainly, uh, you know, that's a, a, a good, uh, just, they're, they're great pollinators to get to know and support. So, but you can see here, uh, bumblebees, um, they have this interesting life cycle where they are actually social uh, during the growing season. So the queen bee actually uh, lays eggs, builds a nest, the headers worker bees. Um, but then at the end of the season, they go into a solitary phase where the workers die off. And right now, we're in a phase where the queen is the only surviving member of that colony um, and is responsible to establish the colony for this next growing season. Uh, and so we're in this early spring phase right now, and you know the question you can ask yourself is, is there any resources in your yard for that bee to start that new colony? Uh, because we need an awful lot of nectar 
uh, and an awful lot of pollen right now and even sooner for that bee to survive, not only come out of winter dormancy and survive, but actually uh, build up the resources to start that next uh, pollen. And so a lot of times, you know, you may look around your landscape and it's not, there's not much blooming yet or there's not much out there. Um, and that's a famine for, for a queen bee that's trying to start that next colony. Uh, and if, if she doesn't find the resources, there will be no colony. So, you know, these are, uh, it's interesting to think of the year-round need that these pollinators have. And so I just highlight that. Um, you can see the different um, seasons here from winter all the way through autumn where, you know, we need, we need the flowers, the blooms, we need the water, we need the habitat. Um, and so there's a year-round kind of cycle that we think in when we think about supporting pollinators and creating the habitat um, that's going to help them thrive. Um, of course, I'm going to fast forward here to this slide uh, next because, you know, as we get to thinking about specifically what, who are these pollinators that we're talking about, uh, the European honeybee is always one that's very familiar to folks. Um, native bees are less familiar, so those are the ones that I, I usually highlight a little bit more closely. But we also have butterflies, moths, and flies, and they do some pollination as well. Uh, moths are, and flies are kind of underknown, maybe underappreciated pollinators a lot of times, um, doing all, an awful lot of that pollination as well. So, but these, of course, are the most efficient pollinators uh, because they're, they're the only animals that purposefully collect that pollen as part of their life cycle. Um, and so they feed that pollen protein source to their young, and, and that's how they, they uh, produce that next generation. And of course, the nectar is a carbohydrate that they use for the energy that they, um, they need to, to do their work, uh, and then for the European honeybee to turn into honey. So, just a, a little compare and contrast here, you see the European honeybee is highly social. Um, it's in, typically managed in hives, or they nest in hives, um, perennial colonies, and they produce honey. So there's, um, but there's a lot of differences between this European honeybee and our native bees. Um, they are solitary, so they, they don't typically work, uh, you know, bumblebees kind of are an exception because they have that period during the summer where they are in a colony. Uh, but native bees are solitary, typically nesting in the ground or in stems or cavities. They have an annual life cycle, and they don't produce honey. Um, and they're not aggressive at all, so they don't sting. Um, sometimes with, uh, you know, the European honeybee, you know, you do have to be aware of that. They, they defend their hive as well. And so uh, native bees don't necessarily do that. They really are not um, a threat at all. Bumblebees can sting. Of course, if they're under threat or if you grab them or that sort of thing, but they're not going to typically. Um, so, you know, there's just uh, some differences between the two groups of bees that are interesting. Uh, here's a little poster that just shows the vast variety of native bees. There are so many native bees out there, a lot of times we just aren't as familiar with them because they're solitary. They're just here and there. And if we don't have the plants that are attracting them, we won't see them in, in the landscape. Uh, but if you, get, if you start to, to, to enhance pollinator habitat, you'll see bees you have never seen, uh, and they will show up. Um, so there's over um, 4,000 species of native bees in the U.S., at, um, at least 400 in Kansas. Uh, of course, we talked about they provide a lot of valuable pollination, especially for our wild native plants um, that create biodiversity. So you can see here from bump. Yeah, we've got, you know, sweat bees, bumblebees, um, a lot of the, some of these bees have really unique, um, the metallic sweat bees that have kind of a green metallic coloration, uh, you know, leaf cutter bees, we've got a lot of different native bees that are kind of fun to get to know uh, as you pollinate your garden. Uh, so native bees, we've already talked about, um, <coughs> primarily I want to highlight on this slide that, um, you know, of course, the difference with bees is, is the nesting, and that's one of the biggest differences we have to account for is they don't nest in, in these groups, they nest either in the ground or in plant stems. And so typically, you know, if we were to <clears throat> roughly 70% of our native bees are actually in the ground, and that's where they're at right now, a lot of them getting ready to 
um, emerge at some point here in the spring, um, there will be 30% that are in our plant stems. And so uh, a lot of them are overwintering in a stem, in a plant somewhere that's hospitable or you know, that they can hollow out and use. Um, so we, we have to learn as gardeners to look for these habitat areas that these bees are using. We have to find those and then we, we have to start protecting those when we do find them or create them in our backyards and uh, that, that is possible. Um, our ground nesting bees, there's a, a vast majority of those are 70 percent. Uh, a lot of bumblebees um, as well will nest in the ground, but, but a lot of times we don't think of leaving an undisturbed area in the landscape. We want to cover everything up. We put the weed fabric down. We throw a bunch of mulch on it. Um, things like that. And you know, for our, for pollinators, native bees, that doesn't work if we cover every square inch, right? They actually need bare ground, believe it or not. They need open, warm, bare ground. And so, uh, a south-facing area that warms up quickly, that has loose soil or a, or a pile, you know, loose soil, something like that. Um, you'll find bees nesting in that, um, and so a lot of times we, uh, as we get to, to know these bees, um, you'll start to see these in the spring, and you can look for them. But the, you know these little holes in in the soil with little mounds kind of around that as they hatch out. Um, those bee burrows you can see there, uh, and so a lot of times you know it's just recognizing that's bee habitat. And so what can I do there to enhance that, protect it? Uh, we've got ground nesting bees uh, in that area. So you know, learning that that is a pollinator habitat right there. Um, so um, stem nesters, of course, are the other 30%. And those typically are in, in cavities or stems. We said like old trees or some of our shrubs that have hollow stems. But leaf cutter bees are a notorious example of those, and you can see here uh, we, we get questions about these little C shapes that get cut out of leaves on plants, and that's you know that's actually a beautiful thing to see in your landscape uh, because uh, you've got leaf cutter bees active, and they're cutting off sections of the leaf to harvest and carry back to the stem that they're nesting in, and they provide um, they they provide the kind of the cells they they line the cells of that nest with the leaf matter and the material that they've collected, and then they harvest pollen and uh, nectar, create a little pollen, uh, bee bread is what they call it, and, and put it in there with that new egg that's laid, and that would be the food source. And of course, this cycle that's going on without us even hardly knowing it or uh, you know, maybe even seeing it. Maybe the only evidence we see is these C-shaped cutouts in my uh, my landscape. And but that's a good thing because that's a native bee uh, doing its, its work, uh, native pollinator right there. So here's a wool carter bee. This one uh, I took a picture of because it was these are interesting. Um, not not necessarily harvesting leaf parts, but this bee actually is harvesting the trichomes or the hairs off of our plants. And so it, it does the same thing. Um, it basically will be moving through your landscape looking for a plant that's got these, kind of like some of our mints do, they have a lot of these uh, trichomes <coughs> on them. And they will harvest those plant parts as well and use those in their nests. And so we, we as gardeners uh, almost have to learn, we've got to share our plant material with these bees, we kind of expect them to take some of that and, and use it for their nesting. Um, and so, uh, you know, as, as we learn that, we can protect and provide for those nesting sites. So that's one of the key things we talk about with native bees is learning to identify and protect those nesting sites. Look for those, get to know that uh, maybe you can leave more material in your landscape for bees to nest in. Uh, and maybe not disrupt things quite as much uh, throughout that process so they have a chance to finish their life cycle. Um, so we can either identify nesting sites or we can also create nesting sites. And there's, there's ways to do that. Um, you know, there are nesting blocks. We can actually, you know, we'll have gardeners that'll go out and actually put a snag up in their, in their garden, you know, an old stump, you know, that these uh, carpenter bees can nest in or different things. So, um, there's ways to create nesting sites or get to know where bees are nesting. And of course we need pesticide-free habitat in our pollinator gardens because this is, 
you know, obviously bees being insects, if we're out spraying uh, insecticides, obviously that's going to be very uh, threatening to them and not, uh, they're as sensitive as any other insect to, to our insecticides for sure. But even fungicides and some other products can, you know, can have non-lethal effects on pollinators. So generally, if we're building pollinator habitat, our goal would be um, to make that pesticide free uh, in our yard. That would be an area we protect uh, from sprays. Uh, and and that, that does make it work the best. Now, uh, of course, it's more than uh, habitat. We also need pollen and nectar. And of course, those things we're familiar with. Um, we, a lot of times, have to learn how to evaluate our landscape for these resources. Do we have them? A lot of native bees are only active for a short period of time. So maybe only two to six weeks that adult bee is out flying around. Uh, so if you don't have blooming plants in your landscape for that two to, th to six week period, um, that bee may not reproduce at all. Uh, you know, because some of these bees don't fly uh, real far distances, especially the smaller ones. And so uh, we want to see things blooming throughout the season, not only for aesthetics in our, in our gardens and landscapes, but it's the bees, of course, um, they need regular access to pollen and nectar and those floral resources. And so, you know, uh, flowers that are attracted to bees, uh, you know, a lot of times color is, is, is critical because blue, uh, bees actually see more ultraviolet kind of spectrum. And so white, yellow, blue, purple, and violet are, are the best colors, you know, for, for pollinators as far as finding those flowers. Not like they're not going to use a red flower if it's got pollen and nectar, they'll find it. But generally speaking, bees are what they see the best. Um, fragrance, a lot of our native plants and, and plants that are attracting pollinators have a fragrance. It's kind of like that invitation to come to the plant. Uh, or we, uh, you know, and shapes as well um, obviously have an impact because certain flowers are way more accessible to certain kinds of bees. Bees are um, different in the way, in the flowers that they can use. Uh, you know, a bumblebee honestly is going to have a much longer tongue you know, than, than say like a small, a little carp, uh, like one of the small carpenter bees. So it, it can get into flowers that other bees can't. So it depends on the bee uh, and the flower that they prefer. But, <clears throat> but the shape of the flower um, certainly has an impact on what pollinators we attract. Uh, the coneflower shape uh, is a very popular one in the prairie, of course, and it's one we like, so we love coneflowers. And so, Gardeners have good success with cone flowers, so this is one that we find is very attractive to a lot of our pollinators because it's very accessible. You can see the bumblebee, I mean, access to the pollen nectar it is quite easy for that bee to land right on there and move around the flower, collect what it wants, um, and, and that just makes a nice shape for our pollinators. So that's why cone flowers, you know, tend to be a very popular plant in our pollinator gardens. Um, shallow tubular flowers, um, this would be more like the instrument, which is a, a very fun, unique plant as well, beautiful plant put in the landscape. Uh, and, you know, they have a totally different style of flower where, you know, it's more of a shallow kind of almost tube, so to speak. And so we have different bees that will access these kind of flowers, specifically bumblebees, um, do really well with these because they can push their way into there. And, um, it's, it's definitely a preferred one for some of our bumblebee pollinators. So um, not only is it a beautiful plant, but it, it does uh, have great resources for some of our bumblebees. Um, lots of small flowers. Any, any plants like these that have these many small flowers that open kind of uh, together, such, you know, you can see like the Joe Pie, Goldenrod, Agstacky, some of these plants, <clears throat> you know, they when they're in bloom, you just got this mass all at once of many small flowers, and, and those are very attractive to uh, plants for pollinators. Um, you'll see them just, uh, you, you watch these uh, flowers when they open, and sometimes uh, it's just like the plant's alive. I mean, there's so many insects on it. Uh, it's just, it's pretty amazing to see all the activity on those flowers. This is an example of a sweat bee that's crawling across uh, one of those types of flowers with the, you can see the many individual little flowers there. 
is crawling across just uh, has the, the hairs that just collect that pollen that stick to it. Um, so a lot of resources there. So you can you can find a lot of uh, photo opportunities uh, when you uh, have these kind of flowers in your landscape to, to take pictures of these bees as well. But you know we also attract a lot of beneficial insects with these kind of flowers as well. So this is a hoverfly. Sometimes it gets mistaken as like a sweat bee or something, but this, uh, this hoverfly is actually beneficial in our landscapes because the larva is a voracious uh, aphid eater, you know, and so um, a lot of times we may see uh, something like this and mistake it as a pest, you know, and we say, boy, maybe I need to do something to control that, but that's actually, um, you know, very beneficial. Um, uh, the, the larva of the hoverfly is very beneficial in the sense that it, it consumes those soft-bodied insects that attack a lot of our um, <coughs> vegetables or uh, flowers as well. So, you know, just getting to know which, which insects are beneficial uh, and you'll attract those as well with a lot of these, these plants. Um, so, of course, what makes a, power, a flower pollinator friendly? Well, of course, it's the color we want to attract, but it's really the ample supply of that pollen and nectar. We want plants that have Ample, ample supplies of pollen and nectar, uh, and so ideally that you know uh, we also want it to be not contaminated, of course, with pesticides, like we said. So uh, these are the key characteristics for a pollinator-friendly flower. Uh, pollen, of course, is the protein source for our bees and, and pollinators, and it's essential for bee reproduction. And so the bees mix the pollen with the nectar, you know, and they actually form that bee bread, like I said, it's like a little ball that they stick in the nest itself for that larva to feed on. Um, that's the diet for that larva bee. And, and there's a lot of variation in pollen. I mean, you can really go down the rabbit hole learning about pollen, and um, it's, it's very unique. Um, there's, there's bees that specialize only on certain types of pollen, you know, so if you're not growing certain types of pollen plant uh, in your landscape, those bees won't be there. Um, it's just they're, they're connected together in many ways. And so you can see here a sunflower and how easy it is to take pictures of bees on sunflowers because they're just such a great, they're loaded with pollen and, and you can just sit there and take picture after picture of a bee just collecting pollen on a sunflower. Um, nectar, of course, is that carbohydrate source. Um, that's kind of a fuel source uh, for bees. Uh, and other flower visitors as well. You'll see uh, it's not just bees that use flower resources. There's a lot of other insects that do. But, uh, you know, sugars, um, they need that fuel to do their work and to continue their uh, reproduction. So nectar, of course, we need flowers that produce a lot of nectar as well. And, uh, of course, if you get, get your photo, if you get your camera right, you can see those drops of nectar as well on on the, the sunflowers, but maybe other flowers too, but that's a rich source that, that those bees uh, are looking for. Um, so not all flowers produce pollen and nectar. Sometimes we get questions about that. Of course, we have our wind-pollinated plants that drive us nuts in the fall, like the ragweed. Um, they don't rely on insects for pollination, so they make copious amounts of pollen and just throw it off in the wind, you know, and it's like that's the stuff that drives us crazy. So. Um, some trees do that too here in the spring, you know, our wind pollinated trees are just throwing pollen everywhere and it gets uh, a lot of allergy sufferers uh, pretty frustrated during <laughs> <laughs> these times of the year. Um, so anyway, uh, but bees will use that pollen. I mean, there are some trees that are very favored by bees, especially some of our maples, willows, oaks, elms, and ash. Um, you know, our oaks and maples uh, are very attractive. Willow is, is highly attractive for pollinators because it opens so early. It's one of the, it's one of the first flowers uh, that, that opens. Maples and elms have already, most of them have already bloomed already. I mean, the flowers have opened, they're done. Um, so th these things open early in the spring and it's a source for bees. Um, oaks are, are coming up too. So, you know, there's just a, there's a pollen source there with our trees. Um, I also like to highlight that sunflowers are bred to actually not have pollen. So you, as a gardener, you may be wondering <clears throat> that, you know, and that might be something to, 
pay attention to. We have varieties of sunflowers now for cutting, you know, um, that are bred to, to not produce pollen. And so, of course, if you plant that in the landscape, the bee comes and visits the flower, there's nothing there, you know, no food. Uh, so you want to be aware that uh, certain varieties uh, are selected not to have pollen uh, that we might find out in the, the landscape trade um, for various reasons. Uh, we might also have uh, single varieties versus the double varieties. And so if you've ever seen the double flowered types of uh, echinacea, coneflower, or various other types of flowers, um, there's an interesting, um, you know, sometimes those flowers look more interesting and, and gardeners want to purchase that because it's different. Uh, but the reality is on something like this where you've got this double flowering uh, flower head, uh, double forms of flowers, basically there's no access for a pollinator. I mean, there's no way for a bee to get to any of those resources and, and probably less resources in general on that flower. Uh, versus, you can see on the top um, corner there where our more traditional cone flower, easily accessible, very easy access, landing pad for the pollinator to come and visit that, get the resources. Um, so, you, you know, you want to be aware, you know, typically it's our standard varieties are, of these plants that are the most beneficial. Um, the new hybrids that may have been bred and crossed and uh, for specific traits like this, such as a double form flower, uh, typically are just not going to be as supportive for pollinators. And they might look, look nice to us, but to a pollinator it's kind of useless. Uh, and so. Anyway, uh, just keep that in mind. I mean, we also have varieties of some of these cultivars that they change the color on the flower head as well. So you might get, you know, more like a white, whitish green kind of color that uh, pollinator just isn't it, it isn't as attractive. And so you know, that's why I said I, in a pollinator garden, um, that's the place to use these standard varieties of our flowers. You know, things that that are just tried and true in that sense. Uh, that we know are going to support the pollinators. Um, okay, so uh, we, we talked about a little bit about planting for pollinators, but of course we're talking about all three seasons. We want to have these flowers accessible all throughout the season. So, you know, a lot of times an easy way to think that through is just to start with three different species, spring, summer, fall. You know, start simple, start small, don't overcomplicate it, but if you can pick out and have three species in bloom each season, um, that's going to be a nice start. And you know, and maybe it's just starting with a small uh, garden area and just working it bigger from there. You know, so a lot of times, um, so if you can get three of each variety uh, and plant them out there, uh, we're trying to really. Our goal is to evaluate our landscape and try to avoid feast or famine for pollinators. We just want to be sure we have uh, blooms going uh, consistently. And you can see here, this, um, this is a, uh, a little chart here that you can find from the Xerces Society, which is a great resource to look up online. The Xerces uh, website has so many resources you can find. But this is just a little chart that highlights, you know, uh, staggering those blooms out. So you can plan out your, your planting so that you have blooms starting in early spring all the way through the end of October. Uh, so. Yes. What website did you see? Xerces. Uh, uh, X-E-R-C-E-S. Yeah. Xerces. X-E-R-C-E-S. Yeah, look at that, that website. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're, they're one of the best resources for pollinator information out there. Yeah. Um, okay, so of course sun, sun is always important because most of our flowers uh, produce more pollen and nectar and sunlight. So if you have a sunny area, that's always going to be more productive to work with for a pollinator garden. Um, if, not that we can't use shadier sites too, but uh, obviously um, insects prefer warmer. Uh, you know, think about the bees, they get really active as soon as it warms up, you know, in, during the day, a lot of insects do. And so and if it gets warmer quicker, they're more active. And um, so just consider, you know, where best to locate, you know, pollinator planting. We have a nice uh, native plant guide, several of them actually at this website, plantnativeks.weebly.com. Um, so this is a, uh, an extension 
website that actually houses several different documents, publications on how to establish native plants in your yard, depending on your kind of what your goals are. So if you're just wanting to landscape with native plants or you want to actually start like a little prairie restoration, there's different aspects to this. And so these guys kind of walk you through that basically. It's, they're pretty, pretty uh, nice resources that I'd like to, to have people look at just because uh, it's a little more of a step-by-step -step approach to think through the different steps you might want to go through in, in establishing a, a garden with some of these native plants and things. So, uh, so that's a good resource to be aware of. Okay, so finishing up here, we're going to just, I'm going to show you some plants because I think it's always fun to look at plants in the springtime as well. Um, so a lot of times, um, one of the, the keys with, when we're thinking about pollinators, like I said, a lot of times in our landscapes, uh, we can think it earlier and later than we're currently thinking. Um, uh, you know, are you thinking about having blooms in late February and March in your landscape? You know, are you thinking about having blooms all the way through November in your landscape? Because um, sometimes if we can expand that season, um, you know, that's of course the, the bumblebee illustration that gives you that. Uh, they, they need those resources uh, as long as we can provide them. So er, expanding early and late is helpful. Spring bulbs are a great source for a lot of our pollinators. So there's, you know, we've got hyacinth crocus. There's a lot of different uh, bulbs that folks use in the spring that pollinators can uh, get some resources from. And so you can see a few of those there. Um, anywhere from early spring to mid spring to more late spring bulbs. And so you can experiment with bulbs in the landscape. Um, as a source of some early uh, blooming and resources for pollinators. Um, we've got uh, spring weeds, of course. Now, some folks want to eradicate the spring weeds. It depends on, but maybe there's a section of the yard that can just be let go, right, for pollination. And so, you know, henbit, um, dandelions, clover, these kind of things are actually pollinator resources. And they can be uh, used by pollinators for uh, you know, nectar or pollen. Uh, so sometimes it's even just identifying that we have maybe a section, I don't need to spray the weeds out, you know, I can let this just go and let, let pollinators have some resource. So uh, this plant is a neat one for bumblebees. It's uh, Baptisia or false indigo, and that's a native to Kansas, and it's a uh, very long-lived plant in the landscape. We've had one for probably a decade or more in our demonstration garden that it just comes back every year, and it's very deep-rooted. Once you have it established, you probably never could transplant it. I mean, they are just, they root in so deep. Um, but once they're there, they're just reliable, and they put these spring blooms out. Um, they're a legume, and so they have those tubular flowers. And here you can see that there's, that's queen bumblebee. That you'll never see a bumblebee that big early in the spring. If you see one that big, it's a queen. And so you know, okay, the queen is out foraging. Starting, to, starting that nest, and um, that's, I saw this one and, and snapped a picture of it because it's like, yeah, our Baptisia is supporting that queen bee getting her nest reestablished, right? So, so I knew right away this was a good pollinator plant. It's like the queen bee's on there. So, um, <clears throat> uh, columbine, uh, aquilegia canadensis, so this is a native columbine, so if you do have shade, this is one you can grow in the shade. It supports pollinators. We've had this one, and it precedes itself. It comes back. Um, it, sometimes it can be a shorter-lived perennial, but it, like I said, the seed is viable, so you'll see it just kind of receding itself and coming back in that spot where you plant it. So if you get to know it, you'll just see the new seedlings, and you can save it, let it grow. And, um, but it, it'll just kind of reproduce itself in an area. Uh, it does well in the shade, and it does produce a spring bloom, you know, for you know, a good portion of the spring. So. Blue star, that's the Amazonia, that's that neat one too that has kind of a bluish color. So sometimes that's a unique color for a native type plant. And uh, tough perennial that can, can be adaptable as well uh, and has a little bit of fall color also. So that's a, uh, one that is, is kind of fun to experiment with. We've got a couple of those that we've planted and I really like the texture of these as well. Some of them have a nice texture in the landscape even when they're not in bloom, they just have a neat uh, texture that they can add into the landscape. 
big wort. Um, this one is a very prolific nectar producer. It's not a, it's not, like I said, some of these plants aren't necessarily as aesthetic as we'd like them to be, but this one is a sticky plant. It, it just produces so much nectar. And so, you know, if you really get into a pollinator garden habitat, you can experiment with varieties of figwort um, that have wonderful resources for, I mean, you'll, you'll just see every pollinator in the sun looking for figwort. Bee balm, um, Kansas native there, um, the, uh, and that one is easy to grow as well. Uh, we've got lots of different varieties of bee balm and summer blooms, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a great one in the landscape. Uh, so you get, there's, of course, some of these can spread themselves, and so as you get to know the plant bee balm, the native can, it can kind of spread and prove itself and create a little patch. So sometimes you may have to control it a little bit, depending on which variety you decide to, to plant. But uh, Agasaki or Nice Hissa, this one is a, <coughs> another one that can <coughs> be adaptable. Yeah, it can actually work in the shade. Uh, shadier spots as well as sunnier spots. So, you know, if you have a landscape that's kind of dappled or, you know, that sort of thing, um, has great nectar uh, sugar concentration. So, that's a popular one, you know, in pollinator gardens. Iron weed is another one. This is a native. <coughs> this is one um, that blooms in the summer and also is associated with a. Um, some of our plants have specialist bees associated with them. So this is one of those plants that has sort of a specialist bee that it works, that works with this plant and uh, longhorn bees specifically. And so you might start to see new groups of pollinators coming in as you get some of these plants established. Um, and, and so that's, sort of, <coughs> that's kind of a neat thing. The blazing star, Liatris, uh, is, a, is a neat Kansas native with a spikier flower, so you know you have different forms of flowers that grow, this one grows kind of more on flower spike um, in the summertime, so it's a fun fun one to put in mass, you know, in a little clump in the landscape. You know, boy, it's a fun, showy plant when it's in bloom. Prairie clover, uh, it's another one that supports uh, ground nesting bees, these polyester bees, and so, you know, if you get, get a patch of prairie clover established, um, you have this neat, uh, I will say it takes a little while, you have to be patient with this plant because it's a slower to establish plant and everything likes to eat it. Uh, rabbits, um, everything just thinks clover is, is tasty. So you might have to protect it for a while to get it established. But uh, it is associated with a lot of pollinators. Uh, Rattlestake Master, that's a cool looking unique plant. Um, almost has a yucca kind of leaf look to it, but it, uh, these two, the Leavenworth Ringo and the, and the uh, Rattlesnake Master, have really unique uh, flower heads. And so, you know, sometimes just you're looking for something unique and different. Um, this uh, Leavenworth Ringo is actually an annual. Um, so it's an annual flower that blooms like crazy, but it's native. And so it's very, almost looks like a thistle almost, but it's um, such a unique purple flower in the landscape and the pollinators love this thing. Um, so you can get a seed and get, get a patch established and it'll just kind of reseed itself a lot of times and come back uh, as you get to get a, get a patch of it kind of going. Um, let's see here. We have, <coughs> I might do a couple more slides. Milkweed of course is popular because uh, you know, with the monarchs and everyone uh, interested in butterflies, we know that milkweed is great for monarchs, uh, butterflies, but also, you know, a lot of other insects use milkweed for its uh, nectar as well. So that's a, that's a key thing to consider. Um, and so we have a lot of species of milkweed, the butterfly weed, the common milkweed. Some of these milkweeds are, are more likely to spread and uh, colonize an area like the common milkweed. So you do have to get to know those as well. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for a more compact milkweed, the butterfly weed is probably the best choice. But, uh, you know, just options that are there. Uh, Penstemon I mentioned earlier, but you can see here um, in this photo how these bumblebees, you'll just watch them just, they'll just, they have the strength to just pry that flower open and just crawl in that, in, in the flower itself. I mean, that's how, 
uh, intense they are about getting resources in these flowers. You just watch them take a head first <laughs> dive into the flower, <clears throat> and it, you just doing their thing. And you know, it's it's just a fun thing to see how pollination, you know, uh, the strategies these bees have to get at that that resource. Purple cone flower, we kind of talked about that one, and sunflowers. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of sunflowers for Kansas, the state flower. So we've got the annual sunflowers. We've got perennial sunflowers like Ridge's sunflower, Maximilian, uh, the willow leaf. <clears throat> and some of these perennial types are, again, they spread vigorously <laughs> with, big, with rhizomatous uh, root, root systems that uh, will take over an area. So you, if you have a small, small landscape that some of those may not be too exciting to you because they, they really want to take over. <coughs> so you do have to kind of get to know some of these plants to real to, to determine you know if they're going to be good for your for your landscape. But Jerusalem artichoke is actually in that category as a sunflower uh, family. Uh, so some people actually that's an edible one that uh, some folks will grow as well. False sunflower can be used in landscaping, uh, you know, more, if you're into sunflowers, but maybe on a smaller scale, the false sunflower actually can, it stays a lot smaller and is, is probably a better landscape style sunflower um, that, uh, that can be used and they bloom for a long period during the summer, so they're kind of neat plants. <clears throat> Mountain mints, uh, this uh, pycnanthemum species uh, is a native mint, and so it, it uh, really unique. We, we planted this several years ago, and, and it is, I can vouch for it being a pollinator magnet. I mean, it has pollinators on it. Uh, once it's come up and starts flowering, uh, basically early summer all the way through frost. I mean, it's just pollinators all over it. And it's a really unique texture and color in the landscape. Um, it's, it's kind of a lighter green with these um, unique shaped leaves. So it really uh, planted with some cone flowers or some other natives. It really is a nice contrasting plant, actually. Uh, so it's kind of an underused uh, pollinator garden plant. Joe Pye weed, we had mentioned earlier, is one of those uh, late summer bloomers. Goldenrod, many of people are familiar with, late summer again. So we're extending the season out. Uh, end of the summer where pollinators are needing those resources. Goldenrod is really our go-to. Uh, blue sage is a fantastic one. This is, uh, blooms at the end of the summer as well with a blue colored flower which just really stands out. Kind of a neat native uh, uh, called Salvia azuria. Uh, and that's a fun one too. I really enjoy that, that plant. Helen's flower um, is really a late summer flower as well, or some people call it sneeze weed, if you've heard it called that before. Kind of a funny name for it because it's an insect pollinated plant. It's like goldenrod, it gets a bad reputation for allergies, but it, it's insect pollinated. So these plants that are insect pollinated, they don't release all this pollen. It's very concentrated. Um, so it's not going to give you allergy problems, most likely, but, uh, but it's a late, uh, it can bloom all the way up through October. I mean, fairly vigorously, so that's a, a late one. And Aster, I'll, I'll end with this one because it's kind of our late summer, uh, or I should say late fall. You know, we can get Asters that will bloom at the end of November a lot of years. And so uh, if you just research different varieties, um, some of these are really uh, pretty, um, cut that we covered with pollinators, you know, in October, November time frame. Uh, because they're the only thing blooming at that point, you know, but they'll be covered and covered, uh, and, and they're also very beautiful at that time of year, too. So uh, so that's just a sampling of plants. I mean, that's not an all-inclusive list, but it gives you some idea of the beauty of the plants, plus, you know, just the reality of uh, supporting pollinators as well. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there on that slide, and if you all have any, I think we might have a couple minutes for questions, if you Happening. So, yeah. So, are you saying that, well, are there no honeybees in North America that are native? Because, so before the Europeans came over, there were no, there was no honey? That's, yeah, and, and somebody probably would know that answer. I don't know specifically if there were um, an American version of that bee. 
that being, I'm sure there's some bee experts around that can tell us there's some entomologists. I'll have to ask that sometime. But yeah, primarily what I understand is a lot of the common uh, honeybees that we're familiar with are the European. You know, they were imported, so it's just. But I'm sure they adapted here. They, you know, they obviously thrive here. They're not endangered by any means. Not like our native bees. And so um, that we're we're very familiar with seeing those out in the garden er everywhere. You know, um, so they, they do very well. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting that they aren't actually native. Uh, but I suppose um, they're just, uh, we're, we're exposed to them more and so we're familiar with them. And so it's, it's nice to be able to highlight the other bees that we often don't see that are out there doing all that work too. So yeah, good question. So yeah, utilize those resources, or you know where to find us if you have questions down at the extension office. I mean, we're that's what we're available for. Yep. I think sometimes it's hard to actually find plants that match what you're saying. Oh sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Where are you getting it? Right. Yeah, so. Do you have sources to recommend, or do the um, yeah? One of the best places uh, is, and actually, that's sales coming up is the Dick Arboretum in Heston. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we go there every year to buy plants because they they have a native plant sale, a huge one in the spring. Uh, end of April is when their sale is, and so they sell them in you know small containers, and you can you can get every one of these, most of them down there. Uh, and a lot more because I mean, they have a big sale. So yeah, I, I like to point people. That's their mission at the arboretum. There is to promote you know uh, native plants and just that understanding of, of our ecosystem and all those things. So they um, go to the, the they call it Florida Kansas sale and, and for you or if you look up the Dick and it's spelled D Y C K arboretum uh, online, you'll find their website and. They have their native plant list out that you can look through what they're going to have for sale. And, but it's at the end of April, so just a little trip down the road here, and you can buy, yeah, you can get all these plants there. And that's that's been one of my favorite spots. You can also order them online anymore, and, you know, from, from uh, nurseries that'll ship you flats of, of plants, you know, as well, just depending on how you want to do it. You can start yours from seed, too. There's a lot of these can be started from seed, and you can grow them yourself. So we have gardeners that do that as well. Yep. Are there any places in, in Salina that you say you have to have some? Um, that's a good question. I every once in a while, if you're you know looking through the, the box stores, they will have some of these plants, um, but it, it depends on the year and where they're getting their shipments from. So you kind of have to know what you're looking for. So if you go through your, I get I get on the Dick Arboretum website and I look up their plant list just to see all the plant names and characteristics and when they bloom. And, but then you might go to the garden center and you'll actually see some varieties of those plants. Something I like coneflower, you know, is, is very common. Or, um, you know, some of the uh, Baptisia varieties. So some of these varieties they're actually bringing into the nursery trade, you know, and so they are there if you know what, what you're looking for. Yeah, so you just need to get to know the plants, and, and then you'll see it, you'll recognize it, and, oh, that's a pollinator plant, I just try that, yeah. How can you, uh, what's a newbie's guide to making sure that you're buying something that is, is going to have more pollen rather than less? Well, yeah, and that's tricky, too, because a lot of newer varieties, you know, the breeding may have been done on flowers, especially to enhance the flower for human uh, purposes, not like it looks better, you know, versus what a bee wants, which is the nectar and pollen. So that's what you may have to look deeper into the plant, you know, snap a picture of the tag and try to research it a little more, um, see what you can find out. Sometimes you can't find out a lot. And so that's why I always like to rely on resources like Dick Arboretum, you know, that's selling just the standard. This is seed that was probably collected somewhere, you know, out in the prairie and plants were grown and uh, reproduced just uh, standard varieties, you know, so yeah, you do have to do a little research on new new things, I think, sometimes to and, and to find that, or you can ask us and we can try to help you find it too, so yeah. Okay, yep, one more. Got another question. Yeah. So if, if we want to do, to plant a certain area, where is there, are there people, I know 
there's master gardeners. Are there people that you can go to to get more advice? Oh, as far as design, I actually, um, yeah, you know, we, I mean, there's some different resources online for sample flower, you know, native flower garden layouts, like uh, the Grow Native website from Missouri. Mm -hmm. Dick Art Freedom actually has some sample landscape designs on their website. Um, actually, the Dick Art Freedom, I'd like to refer people there as well, because that's another way you can support their work, is they will do some design for people at, on occasion. And so if you connect with them, that's a service you can actually pay them to do, but it supports their mission as well as to help you get a design put together. Um, so yeah, that is, there are options, yeah, for that. If you're thinking you want somebody else to work on the design, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I have asterisks and lots of these, and they get mildew. What do I do to keep them healthy? Oh, the mildew, yeah. Well, a lot of times it's the location and trying to, sometimes the spacing of the plants to make sure you have air movement. Um, some varieties are much more prone to that, like the uh, powdery mildew, especially like bee balm or some of the zinnias, things like that. You get that yeah, almost every year. Um, so a lot of times, and we, we've got a site where we don't have that problem as much on some of those, and I think it's because there's just a lot of wind that moves through and it keeps the plants drier. But, um, sometimes it's just, if, if it's a site where it tends to hold the wetness, you know, on those leaves more or something like that, um, you may have to, you, sometimes you can experiment with a different plant or, you know, try out some other things that may not be as sensitive, yeah, to it, uh, if it just seems to happen over and over. Because, yeah, then they don't look good at all, and, yeah, there, there's probably other plants that might thrive in that space better, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 Good job. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this is our last lunch and learn for this season. We'll be back in September, October, and November with lunch and learns. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, big thing going on right now is the presidential preferential primary. So make sure you. Go out and vote. You can still vote over at the county clerk's office. And then actual election day is no, next Tuesday, a week from today. And at your polling place. So, um, thank you all for watching and for being here. And we'll see you lunch and learn next September.